All right, good evening. This is Wednesday evening Bible study, and I'm so glad that you chose to join us, whether it's Wednesday evening or a little bit later in the week. And we're going to be looking at Psalm 32. This is a Psalm of David, and there is a theme in this Psalm, and it is the theme of confession. And if you can remember when we were going through the spiritual disciplines, this was one of the spiritual disciplines and perhaps one of the least mentioned spiritual disciplines. We talk about Bible study and prayer and, and meditation and, and so on, but uh, really don't talk a lot in church about confession. And so I want that to be the theme of our lesson tonight. This is a Psalm of David, and it reflects a time in David's life when he was king over Israel, and he sent troops into battle. And, and of course, you know the story. He remained behind at the palace. During this time, he fell into the adulterous sin with Bathsheba, and you can read about that in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. And to make matters worse, he tried to cover up his sin by having her husband killed. For the next year, David lived with his guilty conscience in deep agony of spirit. He became emotionally distraught, physically ill, and quite likely mentally disturbed. By this time in his life, David had accomplished quite a bit. He had defeated numerous nations in battle, had brought the ark back to Jerusalem. He was gathering materials for the temple which his son Solomon would build. And again, it was common practice for a king to accompany his troops during military campaigns and uh, whether the king actually engaged in battle or not. And David had often done that, accompanied his troops. And we can only guess as to why he did not accompany the troops this time. Uh, we can guess, but uh, I wondered, as I thought about this, had he perhaps gotten soft, choosing to stay in the palace rather than living in a, in a tent? Did he lack self-discipline? Did he become lax? We really don't know, but he had apparently become lax in his spiritual life. And I believe that a lack of discipline and dedication in little things can lead to moral failure in big things. It thus becomes vitally important to be faithful in all things, the small as well as the larger things. And I can remember in a class in graduate school, it was a theology class, and I remember the professor said, the thing that God may really, really want you to do today, the important thing is to pick up your socks. And some of you are scratching your heads right now saying, what? Well, think about it like this. Picking up our socks brings us no glory. Probably nobody watches us doing that. And so we're doing the right thing because it's the right thing. And habits, good habits are built on the foundation of small things like picking up my socks, picking up after myself, and so on. Driving the speed limit, perhaps. Um, I also can remember years ago when I was first getting into restaurant management, and I was a young man, a young manager, and I can remember one of the old timers came to me and said, son, I want you to remember this. Don't ever take, I was managing a steakhouse, don't ever take the first postage stamp, the first steak knife, the first steak, because little things lead to big things. And he had seen it happen. And so little things are important. Well, this psalm describes the devastating effects of unconfessed sin and the liberating joy of repentance and confession. So let's pick it up with verse 1, and this is David. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. This psalm begins like the Sermon on the Mount, which we 
covered a year ago with the word blessed, which can be translated as happy or joyful or even exuberant. And David began by announcing and proclaiming the joyful happiness that he discovered in God's forgiveness of his sin. This could be translated as how abundantly, richly blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven. And transgressions, that word, literally means a going away from, a departure, or a rebellion, or a defiance. A transgression is a willful act of rebellion against God's sovereign authority and a refusal to acknowledge His right to rule the lives of His people. And the word forgiven literally means to have one's sin lifted off. In other words, the sin being like a burden and to have that burden lifted off of one's shoulders, covered that word, the mountain of sin that David had committed was now covered or concealed by God. It pictures the imagery of the Day of Atonement, the day on which the high priest took the blood from an animal that had been sacrificed in the courtyard of the temple. He carried the blood to the most holy place where it was sprinkled on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. When God forgives us, God does not count our sin against us. How wonderful is that? It is as if, it's as if we were at a trial in a court. We had been convicted of some terrible crime and were awaiting sentencing. Perhaps I had to pay a steep fine or serve a long prison sentence. Just as the judge was beginning to send me away, somebody came into the courtroom and declared, I'll pay the fine. I'll pay it all. And so the debt to society was paid. And even better, the judge bangs the gavel and says, Not guilty. The crime is expunged from my record. It is as if it never happened. And guess what? For God's people, it gets even better than this. I am given a fresh start, provided with a new job, a new house, a new dwelling place, and even a new title. I am now a child of God, and I am overwhelmed realizing that I don't deserve any of this. That's what God is like when we come to Him and we have our sins forgiven. Verses 3 and 4, David's concealment of his sin. You remember he, he didn't come public with it. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away. What a picture. Through my groaning all day long. You can just feel the pain. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. Thinking about God's hand upon him, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Um, I wanted to uh, give you a quote here. I looked up, I've heard this quote before and I looked it up on the internet. And this is concerning sin. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Isn't that true? We think that we can commit a small sin, uh, but sin, like a weed, grows and grows and grows. For the Christian, when sin is concealed and unconfessed, the results can be disastrous. Here we see actual physical suffering. David talking about his bones wasting away and groaning in pain. For the Christian, when sin is concealed and unconfessed, the results are disastrous. Sin always has its own built-in bad consequences. And the verse comes to mind that we will reap what we sow. And when we sow sin, we always reap terrible consequences. And not only for ourselves, but consequences for other people. David's sin not only affected him, it affected other people. And just as the physical world has laws, such as the law of gravity, so the spiritual world also has laws and consequences. Additionally, David felt God's hand upon him, perhaps being constantly convicted 
by the Holy Spirit of his sin and the need to confess it, to repent. Perhaps he was constantly reminded of the evil he had done and the suffering he had caused to others. David was physically and emotionally suffering and distraught because of his sin. His soul was aching, racked with pain, agonizing, depressed, downcast. The penalty for sin. Well, verse 5 is the pivotal verse in this psalm. It is the turning point, perhaps the most important verse in this psalm. David says, Then I acknowledged my sin to you, talking to God, and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. David acknowledges his sin and doesn't cover it up. And think about this for a moment. How can I cover up my sin? Well, I thought of several ways that we often do that. I may make excuses for my sin, rationalize, be defensive. Oh, it wasn't really a sin or it really wasn't that bad. You've heard the expression, oh, a little white lie as if to excuse a lie as not being a sin. I might just ignore the sin. I'm just going to move on. I'm just going to forget about it. Or I might blame someone else for the sin, not my fault. Uh, oftentimes, if you remember back as a child, we often would point our finger at a playmate or a sibling and their fault, they made me do it. David confesses his sin and think about in James, New Testament 5.16. Christians are urged to confess their sins to each other and pray for each other so that they may be healed. This does not mean that every sin is to be confessed to another Christian. However, there is the principle there and there is, of course, great benefit in confessing our sins one to another. There is something healing about confessing to another believer. I can be comforted by a brother or sister in Christ. The other person can pray for me immediately and specifically and can pray ongoing for me if it's a sin that I'm struggling with. The other Christian can perhaps keep me accountable if it's an ongoing sin, can check on me to see how I am doing. And it's so easy when people talk to us and, hey, how's it going? Oh, I'm just fine. And yet we may have unconfessed sin. David experiences relief and freedom from guilt. And we know that uh, in reading on in, in the account of the life of David, David eventually is convicted by the prophet Nathan, who knows about his sin. Well, David's counsel about sin in verses 6 through 11. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Surely when the mighty waters arise, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Now that David has confessed and found forgiveness and found relief, from suffering, he urges others to do likewise, saying, don't go on suffering, confess to God, repent, and so on. And while God may be found, unconfessed, unconfessed sin may lead to a hardening or a searing of our conscience and make it hard to find God. It puts a barrier between us and God. Unconfessed sin hinders our prayer life. And confession leads to a renewal of God's protection. Unconfessed sin kind of says, well, God, you stay over there. With unconfessed sin, God may withdraw protection, as often happened in the Old Testament when Israel disobeyed God and worshipped other gods. We know that oftentimes Israel's enemies would come in conquer them, and cause great suffering. What a wonderful peace of mind to know that God is our hiding place, our protection, and our deliverer.
songs of deliverance. What a contrast from agonizing pain, physical and emotional, to songs of deliverance. From being in pain, ill and distraught, David is surrounded with wonderful songs. And I can just imagine David, who was a musician, playing his harp and singing. What a contrast. Verse 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go, counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the mule or the horse, stubbornness, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle or they will not come to you. David is counseling others not to make his mistakes. People would have heard this psalm as a song or perhaps a prayer or even a sermon and he urges them not to be ignorant or to be stubborn as he had been. And he warns of the woes of unconfessed sin and the joyful release of confession. He reassures people of God's love when confession takes place. We can be glad and rejoice. And I'm going to just briefly piggyback on this psalm with verse 51. And this has the same theme, confession, and the, the little paragraph before the start of the psalm says, A psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfaithful love. In other words, we ask for mercy, not because we deserve it, but because God loves us, according to your great compassion because of God's compassion. Wash away my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgression and my sin is always before me. Unconfessed sin does that, doesn't it? It keeps coming up and coming up and coming up, bothering and bugging us. Against you only, you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And I'm going to skip down to verse 7. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed, and remember David talked about his bones wasting away. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Create, this verse 10, in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And then again in 13, I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. And again, David is crying out to the people, I want to teach you about unconfessed sin. I had to learn the hard way. Confess your sins. And in verse 17, a verse here to probably most of us, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. In verse 16, right before that, you do not light, delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. Do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. In other words, God is not impressed and doesn't need our religious rituals. Yes, of course, the rituals were important, but what was really important to God was a broken spirit, a contrite heart. Well, a challenge for us is to pray to God and say, Lord, show me any unconfessed sin in my life. Show me where I need to confess and repent as Nathan showed David his sin. And talking about confession, there's a wonderful, wonderful prayer in Daniel 9, which is basically Daniel crying out, confessing the sins of the nation. And in this time of, of turmoil in our nation, I think it's a wonderful prayer to pray for our nation. What better prayers than the prayers that God has ordained in His Word? And so, let me urge you to take a look at Daniel 9 and pray that prayer for our nation during these difficult times. Well, let me close us with a word of prayer. Lord, um, thank you, thank you, thank you that you are such a compassionate, 
and forgiving God. Thank you that you declared us not guilty. As Romans 8 says, there is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. We're dressed in pure white linen, clean and gleaming. And when you appear, we also will appear with you in glory. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.